Our third speaker this evening will be Apollo 11 Command Module Pilot, Michael Collins. General Collins graduated from St. Albans School here in D.C. and then from West Point before entering the Air Force in 1952. He flew as an experimental flight test officer, then joined NASA as an astronaut in 1963. In his career at NASA, he flew on Gemini 10 and then as the command module pilot for Apollo 11, circling the moon while Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed. After leaving NASA, General Collins became the director of this museum, overseeing its construction and its opening during the nation's bicentennial of 1976. He also served as an undersecretary of the Smithsonian Institution. When we were planning this evening, I did what the coordinator is supposed to do, which is to offer each of the speakers a chance to have a little rehearsal or a walkthrough to familiarize themselves with the room to get a sense of the space. General Collins politely declined. He knows this space. Uh, in fact, he probably approved the plans for the seat that you're sitting in right now. We're delighted this evening to have him back on such familiar territory. Please welcome General Michael Collins. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. You're right. I've spent a lot of time in this room, and I apologize in some ways for its design. It's designed for uh, IMAX, not for live speeches. Not sure anybody's up there. Out there, I'm down here in the bottom of a black hole, about to be sucked in by gravity. But uh, <laughs> anyway, it's very nice to be back here, and um, it's, it's always nice to talk about Apollo, a great success story, I think. Uh, Behind me, I put uh, that because it's better than looking at the black uh, <laughs> IMAX screen. Uh, and uh, I like that photo. It's my favorite one. You see in the, in the little thing, there are uh, three billion people. And then in the big thing, there are two people. And uh, <laughs> posing prettily for the uh, photographer who remains discreetly out of view. It's. Uh, but it's nice to talk about Apollo. It, um, as John Glenn described, John F. Kennedy's mandate was a stark and very simple one, man on the moon by the end of the decade. It was such a clear objective, though there was no ambiguity to it. Uh, all factions could pull behind it. One time we had as many as, I think, 400,000 Americans working Apollo. When I was director here, I tried to use the same uh, clarity in this building's construction. It was uh, scheduled for July 4th, uh, 1976, the, the nation's bicentennial. Uh, so we had Apollo, Man on the Moon, End of the Decade, Museum on the Mall, Bicentennial. And I used to go around, I used to run around Washington screaming, Bicentennial, Bicentennial, whenever there was a snag that popped up in the design or funding of the museum, and it helped a lot. <laughs> but you're not here to discuss buildings, uh, I know that, but to ask us, I suppose, uh, what about Apollo? Uh, what do we remember? What was important? I was talking Apollo recently with my daughter Anne, and somehow uh, one small step for a man came up. Uh, what would she have said, I asked her, uh, had she been the first person down that Lem ladder? Maybe one small step for a woman? No, she shot back. Does this suit make me look fat? <laughs> <laughs> but, but back to the end of the decade. Uh, Mr. President, I think you would have been pleased with the flight of Apollo 11. Everything worked so well, so surprisingly well. About the, the flight itself, the thing I remember most is the view of planet Earth from a great distance. Tiny, very shiny, blue and white, bright, beautiful, serene, and fragile. You don't get the full flavor of it looking at, at this because this has to be processed by film emulsions, which are 
pretty crude and then projected. Uh, so it doesn't sparkle like the real thing did. It doesn't shine like a little gem as it would be if you could see it unfiltered. But is the vision true? Well, serene it is not. Fragile it is. The world population when we flew to the moon was three billion people. Today it's over six and headed for eight, so the experts say. In my view, this growth is not wise, healthy, or sustainable. The loss of habitat, the trashing of the oceans, the accumulation of waste products, this is no way to treat a planet. Yet how do you stop it? Our economic models are all predicated on growth. They require it. Grow or die, or maybe both. The dead zone created by runoff from the Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico is now larger than the state of New Jersey and still growing. We need a new economic paradigm that somehow can produce prosperity without this kind of growth. Now turning to NASA and our future in space, I add my uh, voice to buzzes, although not as eloquently. Uh, sometimes I think I flew to the wrong place. Mars was always my favorite as a kid, and it still is today. As, as celestial bodies go, the moon is not a particularly interesting place. But Mars is, and Mars is the closest thing to Earth's sister that we've found so far. I worry that the current emphasis on returning to the moon will cause us to become ensnared in a technological briar patch, needlessly delaying for decades the exploration of Mars, a much more worthwhile destination. I realize there are many difficulties in reaching Mars. It's a very long duration voyage. I even wrote a book about it one time. Equipment reliability, exposure to radiation, aspects of crew selection and psychology, all these things are tough problems. But I don't see a, I don't see a showstopper. They can be solved. I'd like to see Mars become the focus, just as John F. Kennedy focused on the moon. But getting back to Apollo, what was its significance? Historians tell us it's much too early to judge, but suppose, just suppose, we could fly out into space a whole bunch of light years and look around. What would we see? With the right instruments, uh, I think we could detect many, many star-planet combinations as suitable for sustaining life as our own Sun-Earth combo. I have to stop here and... Uh, tell you a brief story. Years ago I was uh, writing about what we might detect in the way of far distant planets and I kept using the word detectable. I write in longhand so I sent it off to the typist and when it came back detectable had morphed into delectable. <laughs> That's wonderful, what a great promotion for a planet. But, but anyway but anyway, how would we judge those detectable delectables? Uh, what categories, what categories would we put them in? Uh, one way I think would be to see if their inhabitants were wanderers and if they had the capability to wander away from their home planet. Our Earth is a bit over four billion years old and in the first four billion in cosmic terms, not much happened. Then in 1968, we left. Apollo 8 left. It exceeded escape velocity and gravity could no longer keep us pinned down here on the surface. The next year Apollo 11 not only left but arrived. 
neither went very far or did very much. But as Ben Franklin once asked, of what use is a newborn baby? I think Apollo was a dividing line, putting Earth, for better or for worse, into a new category, into the big leagues of planets. To me, that is what is the most significant thing about Apollo. If you'll permit me a bit of a alliteration, the flight, the accomplishments, the major accomplishment, was not the flight of Apollo 11, but the 11 Apollo flights. Now, turning from the macro to the micro, turning to Collins, lucky old Mike, uh, my concept of time has always been a bit strange. I can see a, uh, a giant grandfather's clock up in the sky. Pendulum doesn't swing back and forth, it's stuck. Um, it only moves once. It starts way over on the left. That's the young you. Too young to drive, drink, or have a steady girlfriend. Then one night while you're asleep, it sweeps over to the right, to the too old side. The next morning, you're suddenly over the hill, getting bald, don't try running, better add some omega-3 to your diet. <laughs> you know, for a lot of people, it seems that the pendulum has only those two stops, no middle, but not for the crew of Apollo 11. Consider that Neil Armstrong was born in 1930, Buzz Aldrin, 1930, Mike Collins, 1930. We came along at exactly the right time. That pendulum stopped for us in the middle. We had uh, survived hazardous careers and, and been successful in them, but in my own case at least, it involved 10% shrewd planning and 90% blind luck. Lucky, that is how, limited to one word, I would describe my life. Lucky to have found, lucky to have had loving parents. Lucky to have found Pat. Lucky to have two great daughters and seven great grandchildren. Lucky not to be rich, because I think most rich people develop problems, but not poor either. Uh, so that I can spend my time doing things that I like. What more could I ask? The things that I like, I split my time between Southern Florida and New England. I have a uh, small paddle boat with which I fish, striped bass in the north, snook in the south, getting good exercise along the way. I do some uh, watercolor painting. I'm not a pro like my friend Al Bean, but I'm trying to get better. I read a lot, cook, do one triathlon a year, worry about the stock market, keep looking for a really good bottle of Cabernet under $10. Um, I'm moderately busy and, and happy. So, put, put Lucky on my tombstone, but not... <laughs>